Okay, so World War I was fought, at least by American President Woodrow Wilson's reckoning, to make the world safe for democracy. But that didn't really work out too well, because in the years between the two world wars, totalitarian governments sprang up dang near everywhere in Europe, and so we need to figure out why that so is. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked with a healthy dose of right and left-wing extremism, let's get to so it. So Woodrow Wilson's desire for democracy to flourish after World War I was not going to be a thing. Instead, what we see in several places across Europe is the rise of fascist states, and let me define that before going on. And for a definition, let's consult the man who was most associated with the term, namely the Italian fascist Benito Mussolini. His chosen symbol for fascism was a bundle of sticks and an axe. What that represented was a group of people bound to the authority of a single powerful leader. So ultimately, fascism is a political philosophy that emphasizes obedience to an authoritarian leader and which leverages all the resources of the state to fulfill the leader's ambitions. Now, we here in the 21st century are trained to think of fascism as a bad thing. And just to be clear, I agree. Like, nobody wants to live under the rule of an authoritarian turd. And yet, to Europeans in the interwar years, fascism fascism was an attractive option, and we need to understand why. The first reason was the proliferation of World War I bitterness. Many European societies were deeply divided along class lines in the post-war years. Because of the immense need for wartime production, the working class grew in power during the war, while middle class power and influence declined because of the suffering of consumer industries. And there was also bitterness among gender lines as well. Many women had gone to work while their men were off fighting, and many of them cherished their newfound sense of importance to working society. But for the most part, when the men returned, women were expected to go back home and live their days making their husbands sandwiches, and that, to many women, was no bueno. Now, the second reason people were open to fascist states was the rise of communism. To many folks in Europe, communism, especially in Russia, represented a fearful situation should it come to dominate other states in Europe. And just hold on to that for a second, we'll talk about it more later. The third reason people were open to fascist states was economic instability. Recall in the last video we talked about the devastating economic effects of the Great Depression. Huge percentages of the population were out of work, and inflation was out of control, and there seemed to be no way out of it. And it's hard to overestimate the insecurity such a condition caused among the average Europe. So, when strong fascist leaders styled themselves as saviors from these conditions and put the blame for those conditions in all the right places and tapped into a powerful sense of victimization that people felt, for many people, that seemed like a no-brainer. Okay, so let's start with the birthplace of fascism proper and consider Mussolini's Italy. So all the social difficulties I just mentioned were present in Italy in the 1920s, like high employment, severe war debt, etc., and the Italian government was not able to effectively deal with these problems. So Benito Mussolini, who started his career as a left-wing socialist, changed his position to extreme right-wing fascism because he saw that by championing those ideals, he and his followers could gain power in Italy. He spoke ardently against communism and laced all of his language with a healthy dose of Italian nationalism. And so by 1922, after threatening to march on Rome with his army of fascists, the king of Italy made Mussolini the prime minister of Italy. Now only a few years later, the Italian parliament granted Mussolini dictatorial powers for a year, which as you can probably guess, he never gave up. So now Mussolini is in total control of Italy and worked quickly to establish a totalitarian fascist state. And how did he do it? Well, first he used modern technology and propaganda to spread his message to all Italians. These messages glorified war, exposed the dangers of democracy and communism, and most of all, demonstrated how fascism was the answer to the political and economic instability of the post-war world. And for anyone who was disillusioned by the state of post-war Europe, especially for those countries who had lost the war, these appeals made a whole lot of sense. A second, Mussolini made use of a secret police, which in Italy was known as the Black Shirts. For Mussolini, violence was key to squashing any dissent to his message and plan. Many of the members of the secret police were students and war veterans who were eager to use violence in an unrestricted way. And one of their favorite ways to keep people in line was by giving dissenters horse doses of castor oil. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically a naturally occurring <laughs> diuretic, which in small doses, you know, like gets things moving down there. But the secret police would pour whole bottles of this stuff into people's mouth, and that would have them suffering from violent diarrhea for days, which was not only inconvenient, but could often lead to death through dehydration. So, you know. <laughs> That's fun. But despite Mussolini's tactics, Italy never fully came entirely under his control. The Italian monarchy and the armed forces retained some degree of independence. But if you want an example of a fascist state which gained entire control over the state, and I know that you do, then let's go visit Germany during the interwar years. The next fascist state to emerge was in Germany under the leadership of supreme historical turd Adolf Hitler. And again, after World War I, Germany, maybe more than any other European nation, suffered terribly. Because they received the most severe punishments from the Treaty of Versailles, their economy went down the toilet and they were humiliated on the international States. And because the Weimar government could not address these problems, many German people were ripe for the extremist policies of Adolf Hitler. Now, early in his life, Hitler developed deeply rooted racialist ideas, most notably a virulent anti-Semitism, which is to say, a hatred of the Jews. Now, by the 1920s, Hitler had gained control of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which for short was known as the Nazi Party. And throughout the beginning of the 20s, the Nazis gained more and more power in Germany, and by the beginning of the 1930s, Hitler, like Mussolini, convinced the parliament to grant him emergency dictatorial powers, and like Mussolini, 
he never gave them up. So with Hitler in power, he used many of the same tactics as Mussolini to stay in power, but was much more effective in his use of those tactics. Hitler used the radio and television to broadcast his speeches, which were positively overflowing with nationalist messages, anti-Semitic claims, and plans to restore the glory of Germany. In fact, Hitler had his own propaganda minister named Joseph Goebbels. And it was Goebbels who harnessed the power of film to get Hitler in front of the eyes of Germans across the country. Filming Hitler's powerful speeches and his adoring fans lined up to greet him in downtown parades had a way of making Hitler's appeal seem universal. Now, Hitler also made use of a secret police known as the Schutzstaffen, or SS for short. Now, the SS introduced no small amount of terror to anyone who opposed Hitler and his policies, and all of it was organized by a guy named Heinrich Himmler. And I pray to the good Lord in heaven that I am not somehow related to this guy because he was the worst. Himmler was the architect of murder and oppression, the organizer of concentration camps, and the main proponent of purifying the races of Germany. So I'm not even gonna look for a family connection there. Like, I think I'd rather not know. Now, while all this is going on in Italy and Germany, similar episodes were occurring in Spain. Because of the economic and political turmoil in the years right after the war, Spain went into a tailspin. There, the Great Depression ultimately led to the collapse of parliamentary democracy, and that is when competing factions began fighting for dominance. By 1936, a group of leftists called the Popular Front took control, and their group represented the interest of workers and communists. Now, the one group who vehemently opposed this new government was the Spanish army, led by General Francisco Franco. He led a violent uprising against the Popular Front and installed himself as the head of state, and this forcible seizure of power led directly to the Spanish Civil War between Franco and the Popular Front. Now, the reason the Civil War is relevant to what we're talking about here is not just that Franco was another fascist-like dictator, but the Spanish Civil War represented a kind of testing ground for World War II, and here's what I mean. Because fascist dictators love to see other fascist dictators come to power, Franco gained the support for his cause from both Hitler and Mussolini. Franco, let me ask you something. How do you feel about explosive diarrhea? Love it. All right, I'm in. I'm in. However, the Popular Front didn't receive nearly as much support from the Western democracies of Europe, and ultimately Franco won that war and ruled Spain without rivals. And I said this war was a testing ground for World War II, and that's because Hitler and Mussolini observed with great relish that when fascism asserted itself in Europe, Western democracies did almost nothing to oppose it. And that will be a useful bit of information that they will put right in their pockets and come back to in the second half of the 1930s. But totalitarian governments are not only being installed in Western Europe, Eastern Europe jumped in on the fascist party too. Recall that several new states were created in the East after World War I, and they were established as parliamentary democracies. But those democracies suffered, first of all, with all the same economic problems plaguing the rest of the continent, and second of all, because democracy was a very new thing to them, and it is difficult to establish such a system in the midst of a deep economic suffering. You just want someone to come in and solve all your problems, and that is how fascist and authoritarian governments were installed in Poland, Hungary, Romania, and other states as well. And speaking of authoritarian governments, let's check in with Russia, now officially known as the Soviet Union. The last time we visited, the Russian Revolution was freshly over, and Lenin had turned Russia into a communist state. And it's important to know here that while right-wing fascists despise communism, the communist Soviet Union was very similar in a lot of ways, which is to say authoritarianism is just as likely on the left wing as it is on the right. Anyway, after Lenin died, Joseph Stalin rose to power in his place, and I know that I said that Himmler was the worst, but this guy is also the worst. Like, there's just so many worsts in this video. Stalin was responsible for sending over a million political dissidents to force labor camps called gulags, and he had no qualms about allowing torture to gain false confessions out of his enemies. Anyway, after consolidating party power under himself, Stalin implemented a five-year plan, and the goal of this was to rapidly modernize, which is to say industrialize the Soviet Union. And the truth is, the growth of Soviet industrialization during this period was staggering. And you know, that, that's a good thing, right? Eh, not so much. The consequences of that five-year plan were devastating to the Russian people. Millions of workers flooded into these new industrial centers, and because Stalin wasn't much interested in providing decent housing for them, they lived in squalid conditions. But don't worry, their wages were rapidly decreasing as well. And why? Well, because, as Stalin told them through an elaborate propaganda campaign, they were working for the progress of the socialist utopia promised them in the revolution. Not only that, but after the first five-year plan failed, criticism against Stalin reached a fever pitch, and many in the Communist Party called for his removal, not least of which was the luminary of Lenin's regime, Leon Trotsky. In response, Stalin authorized the Great Purge, which was a systematic removal of all Stalin's enemies from the state, which eventually filtered down to some Russian citizens as well. The purge was carried out by Stalin's secret police who imprisoned, tortured, and executed those who disagreed with Stalin. And by now, it should go without saying that totalitarian states made frequent use of their secret police forces to silence political dissent. Additionally, during Lenin's time, a wealthy group of landowners called Kulaks emerged and employed peasants to work their land. Stalin, however, believed that such a class of people were nothing but dirty capitalists and had no place in the Soviet Union. So he implemented a plan of collectivization in which land was taken from these landowners and placed under the authority of the state. And this happened in many places, but the consequences were most severe in Ukraine, which was the Soviet Union's most abundant producer of grain. Because the Ukrainian Kulaks so deeply resented Stalin's collectivization program and worked hard to resist and undermine it, Stalin responded with a policy 
policy that would lead to the starvation and deaths of something like 7 million people in the Ukraine region alone. It was an event that the Ukrainians dubbed the Holodomor, which means death by hunger. Stalin literally cut off their food supply, arrested, tortured, or executed any farmer who withheld food for themselves, and blocked Ukrainians from leaving their region to buy bread elsewhere. It was a truly devastating result of Soviet collectivization and Stalin's ruthless attempts to consolidate power under himself. Okay, click here to keep reviewing Unit 8 of AP Euro. And click here to grab my AP Euro review pack, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lur out.